Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our first professorial inaugural lectures of 2023. Uh, it is lovely to see so many people here tonight. My name is Chris Greer. I am Pro Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Essex and a professor in the Department of Sociology. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This is the 10th anniversary of this prestigious lecture series. And these lectures are a highlight in our academic year, giving us a chance to come together to celebrate the world leading research talent here at the University of Essex. Since 2013, we've been inviting our newly appointed professors to speak about their work to an audience made up of members of the public, our students and staff, alumni and invited guests. We hope that in finding out more about our world-class research and impact, you will also find inspiration and be motivated to exchange ideas. This year, our professorial inaugural lecture series features our new professors giving regional, national and global perspectives on the diversity of issues spanning the social sciences, science and health and the arts and humanities. Please do keep an eye out for our upcoming events. The disruption caused by the pandemic meant that we have not been able to celebrate the appointment of new professors for several years in this way, which makes this a particularly special occasion. In fact, this is the first in-person professorial inaugural lecture since March 2020. Tonight, we will have the chance to hear from three outstanding academics from the Department of Government and our Faculty of Social Sciences, which is widely recognized as one of the UK's very strongest centers for research and education in the social sciences. We're proud to be one of only two universities in the UK to be ranked in the top 10 for research quality for sociology, economics and econometrics, and politics and international studies, according to the government's recent research excellence framework. And when we add to that mix another top 10 ranking for a fourth social science subject, languages and linguistics, that distinguished position within UK social sciences becomes unique. Our work has real impact. From helping to reform prisons in Italy to enhancing conflict prediction at in an international level, from raising government accountability in Nepal to supporting the United Nations to improve disaster management, from assisting policymakers to understand how foreign aid is perceived by the public to improving peacekeeping operations. As you can see, the scope and ambition of our research is vast, and what is exciting is that in the coming years, we're determined to see that impact grow still further. Across our three faculties, our community of almost 800 Essex researchers are change makers, innovators, and free thinkers. They pose bold questions, tackle real world problems, shape thinking, and influence policy. These professorial inaugural lectures are designed to inspire and perhaps also challenge through the celebration of our excellence in research. You'll see all of the qualities of our unique Essex research mindset demonstrated by the world-class academics speaking tonight, Professor Paul Buhabib, Professor Gina Yanatel Reinhardt, and Professor Reed Wood. After the lecture, I hope you'll take the opportunity to ask questions. And then, if those questions are any good, you'll be invited to join us for a drinks reception, <laughs> where you'll have the chance to speak further with our professors and each other. I'd like now to hand over to the Executive Dean of Social Sciences, Professor in the Department of Language and Linguistics, Professor Nancy Kula. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Nancy Kula and I'm the Executive Dean for the Faculty of Social Sciences. So welcome everyone again also from me to our first Professor Inaugural Lectures for this academic year, which tonight focuses on the Department of Government. Welcome to those of you here at the University of Essex this evening with us in the audience, but also a very warm welcome to those who are joining us via our live stream on YouTube. The University of Essex's uh, Department of Government is a vibrant and diverse community of scholars with a shared commitment to excellence in research. The department champions innovative research of the highest relevance for academics and policymakers, with maximum influence on debates and discourse in society. In recognition of its preeminent position, the department is the home of the only Regis Professor of Political Science currently held by Professor Christian Gledich. Since its founding in 1964, the Department of Government here at Essex 
has built a solid reputation as one of the world leaders in political science, and we are currently ranked second in the UK for research outputs in political and international studies. We ask difficult questions to find important answers. Where will the next civil war start? Can we predict social unrest from tweeting patterns? Why should we obey the law? We are renowned for expertise in international relations and conflict, political behavior, political economy, political institutions, political theory, and discourse analysis. And our five research divisions within the department organize their work around these key themes. We offer a distinctive transdisciplinary space within which to engage in the systematic and critical study of ideologies and discourses, and our work li links representation and crisis across the developed and the developing world. Our academics provide historical and contemporary analysis engaging in transnational teaching and research networks and disseminating relevant information to national and international academic and policy-making communities, as well as wider public via publications conferences, and other debating activities. Today we have three professors from the Department of Government who will introduce you to the incredibly diverse issues our research um, that they're engaging in today. Our research changes the world, so let me introduce you to three uh, of our change makers. I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, Professor Reed Wood. Professor Wood received his PhD in 2010 in political science from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a BA in 2001 in history and human rights studies from the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Before joining the University of Essex in spring 2020, he was a member of the faculty of the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University. Professor Wood's research broadly focuses on political violence, conflict processes, and human rights, and he teaches courses in insurgency and terrorism gender and conflict, human rights, and international politics. Professor Wood's current research projects investigate the causes and implications of women's participation in armed resistance movements, the influence of gender diversity on the conflict resolution and post-conflict peace, and the influence of development and other forms of foreign aid on patterns of violence during civil conflicts. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Wood. All right, thank you so much for having me. Let's see if I can slip this in here. Hopefully you can still hear me. Is that loud enough? Okay, great. Okay, um, I think I actually need to see if we can get this going. Yeah, here I am. Okay, so again, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm happy to, <coughs> to present some of my research on um, uh, kind of narratives of female fighters and the role of gender imagery in, in shaping audience attitudes about armed conflict. Um, I should say that this is some research that I've conducted over the last few years with Dr. Devorah Manikin, who is a, um, who's a scholar at uh, the University of Haifa. And we worked together when I was at Arizona State University when we were colleagues there. Oh, I think there's a clicker. There was a clicker. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. All right. Let's see if I, okay. So the, the central puzzle um, that I'm trying to unravel, or the question that I'm trying to address here, um, is based on the observation that lots of rebel organizations have featured female combatants quite heavily in their propaganda materials, uh, and they figure prominently in the narratives that these groups disseminate to both internal and uh, internal being domestic and external international audiences. Um, and so the question is why? What role does... Um, do images of female fighters or the desire for rebel groups to highlight the presence of female fighters in their ranks, um, like what's, what's the relevance of that? What are the strategic motives for it? And then, of course, what are the implications of it? So in this project, Dr. Manick and I kind of combine these questions because we believe that understanding uh, the latter um, required understanding the, the former. So we... Um, we examined lots of different images of female combatants, um, both kind of historically and, and, contemporaneously, uh, and, and uh, contemporary images of female combatants. And one that many people would, would probably recognize would be the role of female fighters in 
uh, the various Kurdish factions fighting in Syria and Turkey in recent years. And so on the screen here, what you see are on the, on the left side, there's uh, an image from the Twitter feed for the YPJ and for their, for their Facebook um, page. And then on the right, there's a photo of a woman <clears throat> who was known as the Angel of Kobani. Um, there's a really interesting story behind her because, in fact, she, she doesn't really exist. Um, but she featured heavily in a number of news reports um, in, this would be about 20, I want to say we're in 2014, 2015, I believe. Um, so the, the story behind her uh, is that she, so she emerged from a, a series of blog posts and media accounts um, of these vicious women snipers, uh, you know, combatants and warriors fighting with the YPJ, YPG. Um, she uh, you know, had over 100 kills of, of ISIS fighters, and so she became this, this really popular heroine in the region and, and began to gain some global recognition, right, in part because it was framed around this, uh, you know, the, the narrative of, you know, this woman fighting, you know, uh, fighting uh, ISIS, ISIS being you know, notorious for their oppression of women and the brutality against women, definitely like opponents of, of women's rights. Um, so this made for, for good, good news coverage. So um, after this story went viral and received a lot of international media coverage, uh, ISIS uh, put out its own um, response stating that she had been killed um, by ISIS fighters. And then the YPG responded by saying, no, in fact, she's still alive and fighting with us. The reality, though, is she never really existed. She was a construct, sort of in a Robin Hood sort of way. There were lots of women who um, fight with the YPJ, um, lots of women who did serve on the front lines, but she was sort of an amalgamation. But she was used both by the YPG um, to gain international attention to their cause and because it made such a good story. Right? It, it generated a lot of publicity, and it made them seem, I mean, not that it was very hard for them to frame themselves as good guys when they were fighting ISIS, but it helped to facilitate this narrative that they weren't terrorists, they were freedom fighters. Right? Um, and this woman was emblematic, or this, this uh, amalgamation, this construct, was kind of emblematic of that struggle. <clears throat> So um, in trying to understand kind of more broadly the motives for uh, armed groups, particularly rebel groups, to rely on imagery of female fighters and highlight the, the presence of female fighters in the ranks, we started by looking back at uh, kind of the way gender imagery is used in uh, propaganda and imagery of armed conflict more generally. Um, and if I had more time, which I certainly don't, uh, I would go through lots of these propaganda posters from the First and Second World War, which are incredibly rich and, and say so much about the nature of gender and armed conflict. Um, I'll be talking about this later in my GV522 module, uh, later this term, so if, you, if you're that interested, you'd be welcome to stop by, you'd be welcome to, to drop in. But the, the point that um, you should take away from these is that in most of the wartime imagery, the propaganda imagery presented by states uh, during war, women figure as, um, as vulnerable um, casualties of war, right, that need protection by typically uh, a male soldier, right? So here we have, you know, a little girl standing outside of her destroyed home. Uh, this is the United Kingdom in, in the Second World War. This is uh, a, a famous propaganda image from the U.S. following the sinking of the Lusitania, right? So we, we see very, you know, uh, uh, centrally um, featured, right, women in these vulnerable positions, oftentimes with, with babies. Even this little girl has, you know, a younger sibling. And we see this replicated again and again. Um, and and in, in fact, some of the, the propaganda posters are really quite on the nose. Um, not just in highlighting the vulnerability of women, but also the awful things that happen to them during war, and particularly that are, that are um, uh, act, enacted upon them by men. So you see this um, image from the United Kingdom saying, have you any women worth defending? I mean, it's hard to get more on the nose than that, right? And this is remembering the, um, what was framed at the time as the, uh, you know, the incredible, brutal occupation of Belgium by, by Germany. Right, so women were sexually assaulted, um, killed in large numbers. So this was, you know, provoking this response from um, from uh, from British men. Right, remember what happened there, and if you have any women worth defending, then then join up. 
right? Of course, it's not just women, <clears throat> you know, younger women. There's also fight for her, right? Remember your mother at home. That's who you're fighting for. Um, and you see this in, in other countries as well. So, you know, and, and again, the World War I propaganda posters are among some of the best, um, at least for, for illustrating this point. But you frequently see, in almost all of them, <clears throat> right, um, you know, the man is going off to war, he's the defender, uh, the children, the women left at home, even when women are kind of the, are, are, you know, when the attention is drawn to women or when they are the intended audience, right, it's, you know, remember, women, remember what happened in Belgium, um, how can you help send a man to fight for you, right? So it's kind of underscoring the gender dynamics of, of conflict. Um, to the extent that women then serve as any kind of active participants in or around conflict, right, they, they are represented in kind of these secondary roles. And they're still there very much in support of men, very much in vulnerable positions. And I love this um, poster from the United States of the female nurse on the right, um, because she is, you know, she would be in a position where she was at least near frontline combat, but, um, and she's a soldier, right, she's, or, somewhat a soldier, but she's wearing a uniform, but still has this very, you know, uh, you know uh, wilting kind of look, you know, very much framed as vulnerable in need of protection. And then here on the, uh, on the other side, right, the girl he left behind, right, women taking up positions uh, in the domestic front, but still the idea that, you know, she's, she's backing him. And also the implication of this being that, like, he's going to remember her service back home, right? So all of this is just to suggest the importance of gender dynamics and gender imagery during armed conflict. And the, um, it, much of these dynamics are built around the beautiful soul narrative, right? And I think we, we get that clearly from the imagery that women in these images are framed as peaceful, innocent, and vulnerable. Um, the central idea is that they fill these essentialist roles as, as wives and mothers, and they inherently require protection from men. Men, by contrast, filling their essentialist roles are aggressive, violent, and valiant, right? And so we have this interesting, you know, kind of joining of, of the aggression and the violent, uh, the aggression and the valiant, valiant and the, and the violent, right? And so their natural role is to serve as warriors and fathers, and their duty is to protect and protect the women and the nation, which in many ways are synonymous, or at least that's the undercurrent of, uh, of the message um, that uh, is presented in the beautiful soul narrative. The beautiful soul narrative, the, the, the point of this, right, is that um, by highlighting the essentialist characteristics of men and women in the context of armed conflict, it legitimizes and encourages support for war. It justifies violence and brutality by men, right? People, even men, who are essentially uh, aggressive and, and uh, prone to violence are not prone to going to war and murdering one another for no reason, or it would be a very small subset of them. Um, so it's important to convince the average man in society to take up arms and go commit you know, horrible acts during wartime. And the, the, beautiful, ser the beautiful soul narrative um, helps to tell them that's okay. Right? Because what you're fighting for is so important, you can do these things. And in fact, it is, it is necessary for you to do these things to protect what matters. And what matters is the nation writ large, but also at a more micro level to protect women, to protect your family, to protect your wife, to protect your child. Right? So the beautiful soul narrative helps justify uh, violence. It frames fighting as, as a natural and essential role that's necessary to protect the nation. And also war becomes an essential test of manhood, right? So you go to war, prove that you're worthy of the women you're protecting, and then at the end of the day, the hero gets the girl, right? There's a reward associated with fighting. Um, and if you resist, right, you're a coward, you're shamed, you're feminized, you're not a real man, and you don't get the girl, right? So there are rewards and sanctions that come into play for whether you follow or reject the beautiful soul narrative. And it's important to note that women are really critical uh, in reinforcing this because they encourage men to uh, participate in these ways and adhere to the call, uh, respond to the call to, to fight for the country. And there's really interesting um, narratives, for example, um, in, the, in the First World War, um, women would give flowers to um, to men who weren't in uniform, 
uh, British men who weren't in, Eurofor in uniform as a way to you know, signal that they were too cowardly to go and fight. Right? Now, it was a small number of women uh, doing this, but, but the, the point remains. Right? Their, their role was to reinforce that they were only going to reward the men who proved themselves by going to battle. OK, so this is kind of a long, long intro to where I'm going. And so I'm going to need to move along really quickly. But the point of this is that rebels also employ gender imagery, although they do it in a very different way. We see it in their propaganda materials. We see it in their public diplomacy efforts and the narratives that they spin to uh, both domestic and external audiences. But the way they frame women during conflicts tend to differ. Right? They often depict women in non-traditional and violent roles. And they highlight intentionally, we argue, they highlight these contradictions between the temporary wartime roles that women play by taking up arms and their traditional social roles, right? This essentialist duty as, um, as vulnerable, uh, vulnerable members of society, as, uh, as mothers, as wives. Um, and I highlight temporary here because there's really interesting work kind of um, extending beyond this by a scholar named Meredith Loken that, that really highlights how this is temporary. And once the war is over, right, women are expected to go back home. And rebels are very clear about that in their messaging. I, I, don't, I don't get quite there in, in this presentation. But um, again, the, the point is to, uh, for the rebel groups, is to use this contradiction of wartime roles and traditional gender roles to help legitimize the group's goals and justify its use of violence. And they do this by exploiting audiences' gendered beliefs. So they, they do it in a similar way, or at least they're playing on a similar um, narrative to the way states do it, but they're sort of flipping that narrative on its head. Right? So they're still exploiting gender beliefs, but they're turning it on its head. So um, I won't spend as much time on these uh, propaganda posters uh, from rebel groups as I did for states. But they're really just to illustrate that um, rebel groups do, in fact, use images of female fighters uh, in a lot of their propaganda materials. And we see this all around the world. Right? We saw it in, in, in Europe, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, um, North Africa. It's also um, one of the, the central points of this research is that it's not only the rebel groups themselves that are highlighting the presence of female combatants, but they're relying on external allies right, to, 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 to disseminate that message as well. And this messaging becomes an important part of the acquisition and maintenance of support from external allies. Right? So these images um, were actually produced by um, transnational non-state actors that had loose affiliations with the rebel groups. So the Association of Eritrean Students, which is actually based in the UK, it was a diaspora organization that was um, mobilizing support for the, um, for the EPLF, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, um, but they were based in the UK. Um, so we see lots of images here. And an important thing to note, and I think these are, this one particularly is, is quite telling, much of this imagery Right, combines both women in combatant roles with their kind of essentialist role as mother or caregiver. Right? So they're, they're removing to an extent the vulnerability from the, the beautiful soul narrative, but still keeping some essentialist elements such as, um, such as the maternal nature of, of women. Um, the point of this uh, is rooted in the desire of rebels to market their rebellion to acquire external support and external resources. So rebel groups engage in a lot of uh, external marketing efforts, and that's what we focus on predominantly in this, in this research. So they're targeting um, different audiences than states often target. States are predominantly focused on targeting their populations to mobilize them for war. Rebel groups certainly recruit internally, but because of their weaker status in an asymmetric conflict, they really uh, rely heavily on external support, both from states and non-state actors. So rebels solicit support right, from, from these actors because it helps make up that resource deficit that they face. And what we argue is that, well, it's, it's clear that propaganda, I think I'm getting some feedback, is a part of that marketing effort. Um, but female combatants, we argue, play a really central role in this. And it's part of a strategic frame that rebels adopt. And so female combatants are used by rebel groups to help construct a more positive narrative about the group and its goals. 
and it helps the, the featuring women um, in these roles and using them in their propaganda helps to humanize the group. It signals the rupture of the normal social order. So it's a, a lot of the, uh, the narrative is framed around this idea that women don't want to be there, right? And so this is where the essentialist gender uh, norms and associations come into play, right? Women would not be fighting on the front lines if they didn't have to. Women want to be at home raising kids. So there's nothing in this that says rebel groups are progressive or, or emancipatory in their goals, right? They're trying to signal that, you know, if given their choice, women would be at home, but because, you know, normal society has been so disrupted, they can't do that. They're left with no other option but to fight for their families uh, and for their, for their ideals. Right? So this represents a huge sacrifice, particularly for women, and that's what rebels are trying to showcase. Right? So what it does is that it frames the violence um, uh, enacted by these women on behalf of the group as righteous rather than wanted. Right? These are you know, people fighting for their survival and for their goal, for their ideals, and, their for, and for their society, not for terrorist purposes, not because they're thugs and brutes. Right. It's also worth noting that uh, media coverage reaffirms and amplifies this narrative. So we can, I won't go through these, but you, know, you could easily find lots and lots of examples of the media highlighting the, the presence of women in, in armed groups. Right? And this helps build publicity for, uh, for the rebels as well. Right? It's novel. Right? You don't expect women to be at the forefront of combat. So when they're there, audiences pay attention. And then after they pay attention, they start thinking, why are women there? Well, women don't normally fight. There must be a good reason. They're, they're engaged in this huge sacrifice. OK, so the expectations that we have for this were that it produces attitudinal effects, right? It shapes the attitudes of outside observers. Yeah. Um, female combatants generate publicity. They promote legitimacy of the group. Their premise, and this is premised on the belief that the motives of female fighters differ from those of male fighters. Um, at least that, that's what audiences believe. And that's the key here. Audiences believe that. And then we have kind of a secondary um, uh, expectation, which is that increases support from transnational allies. And I don't think I'm quite going to get there, because I'm going to have to move through really quickly. So we conduct an online survey experiment in both the US and Indonesia. Um, we use a news uh, article style vignette. This is it. If you're interested, these are the photos that, um, that we found to compare a, a female combatant and a male combatant uh, in an armed group with the vignette here. Let's see, can I finish this in 30 seconds? Here are the survey questions that we ask, but they, um, they address things like the, the level of interest in the group, the legitimacy of the goals, legitimacy tactics, and then the motivations. Um, and then we run our analyses, and we find you know, generally some support for this argument. Right? So this is for the attitudes towards the group, and we find that there's generally some it's marginal effect, but um, interest in the group increases, and particularly the, the belief in the legitimacy of the violence enacted by the group increases in both the US and the UK sample. Um, and then in, for beliefs about the group, we find some support as well, although um, some of them are actually uh, pointing in opposite directions in the case of, of Indonesia. Um, but one of the things that we thought was really interesting is it's very much the case that um, audiences believe that men are much more likely than women to be engaged in rebellion for profit seeking. Um, so that's an interesting takeaway. Uh, we also examined the effects kind of by because an argument. I'm going to have to wrap up on this point, but um, <laughs> uh, we examined the effect over kind of conservative values of audiences. And for the Indonesia sample, we we use a, a measure of support for Sharia law with the argument that um, individuals from more conservative backgrounds or that hold more conservative ideologies would, would be less susceptible to this treatment. And we do find that, right? That individuals that are very conservative uh, tend, tend to uh, you know, be, be less susceptible to those. OK, so I'll, I'm going to unfortunately have to not, uh, not present the, the research on the second part. Um, but I do want to plug the data set that, that I, I created for um, women's participation in armed conflict just really quickly. Sorry to have to cut this short. 20 minutes goes by quickly. Um, but so to, to just to wrap up, um, we argued that rebels often highlight the presence of female combatants and that this represents a strategic choice and an effort to construct uh, a narrative, right, facilitate narrative construction that makes the group seem more sympathetic and legitimizes their use of violence. It has this influence over observer attitudes and that ultimately, although I didn't get to present this, uh, it's associated with external support. And I put this button from the ZANU-PF up here because it's a possible extension 
Try as you might, it is really hard to find images of male combatants holding babies, while you find loads of them for female combatants holding babies. So I want to explore this a little bit more. There must be some more of those out there. All right. I uh, apologize for having to wrap up so, so quickly. But OK, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Really uh, fascinating. And there's going to be an opportunity to ask maybe one question um, at the very end. So keep all of those thoughts um, in your minds. I would now like to introduce Professor Gina Yanitel Reinhardt. Professor Reinhardt received her PhD in 2005 in political science from Washington University in St. Louis and her BA in 1997 in international studies and theater from Rhodes College. Before joining the University of Essex in autumn 2015, Professor Reinhardt was a member of the faculty of the George H.W. Bush School of Government and the Public Services at Texas A&M University. Professor Reinhardt's research broadly focuses on political trust, barriers to participation and access for underrepresented uh, re populations, and the impact of public services. Professor Reinhardt has taught courses on research design, strategic decision making, and data analysis for public servants. Her current research projects investigate policies designed to determine how to establish trust and connectedness among members of communities with diverse identities, how to understand the nexus of mental health and gender-based uh, gender violence in precarious communities, how to govern the marine space to achieve the UK goals for net zero 2030, and how to make research careers more inclusive. Professor Reinhardt is a member of the National Opportunities Network working to help widen access to postgraduate education and the UK National Decade Community for the UK, uh, UN Decade of Ocean Science and founder of the Arise Consultancy, Disaster and Emergency Research Network and Global South Academic Network. Professor Yanitel Reinhardt. Hi, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for your welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks to my colleagues for sharing this night with me. Um, the thing, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Oh. That one? All right. Nope, not yet. Almost there. OK, what I want to talk to you about today is how social sciences can help us make decisions about public services and public policy. And the first thing I'll say right off the bat is that I never cared about this at all. <laughs> Here I am. This is my five-year-old birthday party, one of them, um, because I always got a lot because I uh, went to travel in the summer but I didn't get my friend party on the day. So this was a friend party that was before the day. And there I am in the middle. That green line on my face is on the screen. That's not actually on the photograph. I'm opening presents, and I care nothing about social sciences. In fact, from then until many years later, I thought it was one of the most boring things that you could ever study. I was happy to learn about physics and math and the arts and languages. And to me, social sciences were nothing but dead people and dead languages <laughs> and really boring stuff around the world that I didn't want to know about. But it happens that there is a lot that we can do to help inform policy and decision making at the local level. So I want to tell you about three projects that I've been working on. One is about home safety and prior prevention. One is about the Internet of Things. And another one is about loneliness or reducing loneliness with social prescribing. So I'll start with fire and safety. I have some colleagues here from Essex Fire and Rescue tonight. Glad to have you guys here. We decided to look uh, at what causes accidental dwelling fires 
in Essex County. This is not arson. This is not fires that take place uh, in businesses, right? This is in your house, it's an accident. What happens? And we wanted to look and find out things like what time of day do they happen? What day of the week do they happen? Who usually causes them in what room of the house? Here's something that we found out about different types of people. And when you cluster people into different types of households, we learn some interesting things. Each one of these clusters represents a different type of household. Here on the left, we have people who live in social housing and get benefits. And for each cluster, this red bar represents their proportion in the county. The proportion of households of social housing in the county is this red bar. And all the other bars are the proportion of fires that take place in those households, different kinds of fires. So when the bar is higher than the red bar, that means there's a disproportionate amount of fires in the county based on that type of household. And you can see the yellow bar, for example, which is smoking-related accidental fires, is three times the size of the red bar, which means that there is a drastic overrepresentation in social housing of fires that start by smoking. Another group is transient singles. These are people who maybe are moving from one house to another, maybe living on people's sofas, or what we call rough sleeping without a, a permanent residence, or even a, a semi-permanent uh, residence. And you can see these bars are all bigger than the red bar, too. The black bar is particularly troubling. Those are the fires where people are injured. And that is about three times higher than the red bar, so drastically overrepresented. And the other group is wealthier residents of the county in older houses that are on the outskirts of town and in rural areas. So we said, what would happen if we tried to reduce accidental dwelling fires with an information campaign. We tried to help people understand how to keep their homes safer and how to be safer when they're at home. What would happen if we just randomly went out into the county and said, we're going to give this information to everybody without considering who they are. Everybody has the same chance of getting the information. This black dotted line represents what happens at that average point, where we say we're going to target 30% of the people in the county, and we will end about 30% of the accidental fires if we do that. So along here, as we go from left to right, we're getting more and more of the county dwellers. And as we go from bottom to top, we're getting more of the fires reduced. What would happen if we actually targeted the at-risk groups? So we give the information designed for the people who are the most at risk. Then we get this red line, which is quite higher than the black line. And you can see that up until about 30%, if we only target 30% of the population, but we make sure it's the population that's likely to be at risk, we can reduce dwelling fires, the accidents, by about 80%. Once we get to there, things are pretty steady for a while. And it doesn't matter if we try to talk to 30% of the people all the way up to 50%, even 70%. We could throw all the resources we have at that, and it's not going to reduce dwelling fires anymore until we can actually put in resources for the last 30% of the population. And when we think about public policy, what we're thinking of is that first 30 or 40%, that is the part of the people who really didn't know how to keep the fires down in their house. They didn't know the safest ways. Maybe they didn't realize that they had furniture in front of the power outlets that they needed to move. Or maybe they didn't know that their furniture was blocking the way out, so they were more likely to have injuries. 
That red line is the people who are making an informed choice. These are people who have the information, and it doesn't matter if we're adding to the number of people. They want to keep smoking. They want to keep plugging in power outlets with too many things plugged into them. They understand what the risks are, and they're going to keep things that way. And it's not until later that we get that last 30% when we do something more, more than just telling people information. Usually that's what happens when we start to make things, certain things illegal. We start to find people and things like that. That's when we do something more. And this is the same sort of shape of graph we get for quitting smoking, for example, right? Lots of people at the beginning of learning about cancer and learning about secondhand smoke and learning about how dangerous it is quit, and then we get a really steady line for people who know those things and choose to smoke. That's the choice they want to make. And you don't usually see those things change again unless we can criminalize or we can make it really expensive for people to do those things. So Fire and Rescue Services Home Safety Office said, let's launch an information campaign, and let's send some people out to houses and share information about fire safety with people. And I looked at whether fires decreased or increased or stayed the same before versus after the intervention. The red line is the people who were at risk and got visited, and the blue line is everybody else. They weren't at risk and they didn't get visited. And so what we see is that the people who were at risk had a lot more fires at the beginning, before the program, but after the program, they didn't have any more fires than everybody else. They had the same amount as everybody else. So what does that mean? Let's think about the costs and benefits of this program. We reduced accidental dwelling fires by roughly 65 over the course of the program. The program costs about 78,000 pounds to implement. And the cost of the 65 fires, the savings cost to the county of uh, fighting and administering, administrating over those fires is estimated to be about 2.6 million pounds. So when you say, how can we reduce accidental dwelling fires in Essex County, we say we can use a community information campaign to maximize limited resources by targeting at-risk groups. And those decisions were informed by social sciences and supported by the data analysis. So we work together to achieve that. The next project I want to tell you about has to do with the Internet of Things and the South London Partnership. These are five boroughs in the south of London. Imagine there's lots of London off uh, beyond them. The Internet of Things is all of the stuff that's linked electronically and via the Internet that we don't really think about as thinking, but data is transmitted when we do things like adjust the temperature in our house from our phone, or turn on the music, or turn up the music with the speakers that are on the other side of the house. All of these things are refrigerators. We can have all sorts of things that talk to each other, our cars as well. What would happen if we tried to use the Internet of Things data to help improve public service delivery? This is what the South London Partnership wanted to know. So we took a look at a few different things. The first example is sheltered housing. These are folks who live in houses independently, but they need a little extra help. They need someone to check on them. And someone called an independent living officer checks on them regularly, about once a week. So you can imagine that if something happened and you need help or you fell down and somebody checks on you within a couple hours, that's really helpful. But you can also imagine that if you fell down a couple hours after they checked on you, you've got to wait a whole week before they're going to check on you again. And that could be quite some time. So there's a little device that the SLP put into sheltered housing um, with full agreement 
of the people who lived there. It wasn't a secret or anything like that. And this device tracks just a few things. If you put it in the kitchen, it tells you if the temperature goes up or down, and it tells you if the humidity changes. And for a lot of people, that's actually a lot of information because over time you start to realize every morning at 7.30, Mrs. McGillicuddy's temperature is gonna go up in the kitchen and it's gonna get humid. She's probably making a cup of tea. We don't really know what she's doing. We don't really care whether she's making tea. We just care in the moment that that stops. We care on the day when the temperature and the humidity don't go up like they're supposed to. I'm not gonna bother to explain all the information in this graph, but you can see there are some red symbols and those are alerts for when behavior changes. We don't know what the behavior is again. We just know the signals of the behavior. And those alerts then get transmitted to the independent living officer. Not because they're going to change. They're still gonna check on Mrs. McGillicuddy once a week. But when they come in in the morning, they can look at this and say, oh, I need to check on her today. I wasn't gonna check on her till Friday, but something's changed, I need to make sure everything's okay. And by doing that, some lives have been saved, some decisions have been made to start to put these into all sheltered housing. This was a pilot. But it was this data and being able to process and visualize the data that helped make these decisions. Here's another example, gullies and culverts. When they're working, we don't think about them very much. I think they're fascinating because I love to watch water running into things. And because I used to live in a very rainy place, and trust me, people here don't understand what it means to live in a very rainy place, um, <laughs> unless you've lived in a place like I have. So they're great when they work, the water goes in and goes away, and when they don't work, things get really rough and people start to complain a whole lot more. Cleaning them is really difficult, it can be, and it takes so much equipment and energy to get all the muck out. Usually, if they overflow, it's because they're full of dirt and leaves and all sorts of things like that, right? In the end, you want them to look gorgeous, just like that. I never thought that a culvert would look so pretty, but that's the water coming out that I love so much. So you want that to be really nice and look really great and be really smooth, and you don't want to drive through the picture in the middle, right? So what do you do? you take a sensor and you put it in some of the gullies and culverts. And it tells you when they're gonna overflow, when they're close to overflowing. And you know when the rains are coming and you can look at the weather and actually integrate it with uh, precipitation apps as well and get an alert that says this one's about to be too full. This other one looks okay. And again, these cleaners they are resources that would be cleaning regularly no matter what. The question is, where are we going to send the trucks? Where are we going to send the pumpers? Today they need to go over here. Tomorrow they need to go over there. So it's a reallocation of efforts and energies. How can we help improve service delivery? We can identify patterns and changes in them that help us target our resources more effectively. And the last one I want to tell you about is a question that a lot of people have been asking since before the pandemic, but it's become quite a bit more relevant to people since then. How can we reduce loneliness and social isolation, particularly among the elderly? So we're taking a look at a, an idea called social prescribing. There are partners implementing this, these symbols represent uh, local authorities in the UK and in France on both sides of the channel. And our team at the University of Essex is evaluating what's going on. And all of this is a social prescribing program. So the idea here is that people have a lot of health issues and they go to the GP and often the GP says to themselves, and maybe to the person in front of them, medication can't really help you. 
What you need is a different way of living your life. You need to, social activity, you need the help of social interactions. That will help you feel better. That might help your addiction, that might help your mental well being and your general well being. And so the idea is that if you talk to a social prescriber, that person can help you figure out what it is you need what it is you want in terms of your own health and well-being, and then empower you to figure out how to get those things. Maybe you need to be active in your community. Maybe you need help from your community. Maybe there are a variety of things that you can do to feel more effectual and more effective. And what we're doing is trying to figure out exactly what that means and how it works, because the UK government is rolling this out and has decided that everyone has to have social prescribing available to them. The question is, what's it going to do? Does it do any good? And do we have any evidence that it really will help or change things? So what we thought was, you know, at the individual level, the idea here is that this increased interaction and activity and this empowerment of figuring out what's going on in your own health and being able to take charge of what you do, feeling like you're improving it. All of this helps boost your confidence, your self-esteem. It usually boosts happiness. It can reduce loneliness, especially if the thing you're doing is interacting with people, trying to make connections, right? And they feed each other. The more you do these things, the better you feel, and the better you feel, the more you do them. In the end, the idea is that you are going to engage more with your community and your community is going to be more connected and other people will engage more as well. And the more people that are connected, the more people will want to be connected and there will be sort of a cascade, right? People will become more connected and that is supposed to be good for lots of things. A few years ago, someone estimated that a lack of connectedness in communities costs the UK 32 billion pounds a year. This is a gigantic estimate that's based on tons of extrapolation of lots of different studies. I don't stand behind that figure, and, and I can't say uh, that I would have calculated it the same way. But I can say that people do believe that if we're more connected, we're more economically productive, both because we feel better but also because we help each other out more. And maybe I watch your children while you have to go do an extra job, and then maybe you take me to the airport when I need to go there to get to work. And when we aren't connected and we don't do that, then we have more restrictions on what we're able to do with our own resources, but also we're not as willing to include others in that. So it's supposed to affect our civic behavior. It's supposed to reduce crime. And in general, we're all making each other better off. Ultimately, the reason that the UK and others are adopting this is because it's supposed to take pressure off the National Health Service. And people who go there for social needs, people who are lonely and bored and go to the GP because they don't know where else to go, are now meant to have other places that they can think of to go and connections that will keep them there. This is a really complex system of things. And we are still in the middle of trying to figure out how far these programs are getting to achieve these ends. I can tell you this. For the people that our program is treating, it looks like those people participating in social prescribing are doing better when they're done than they did when they began. So here on the left, we have a graph that shows their first assessment. They answered a lot of questions about their well-being and their health and happiness and loneliness. And these are questions that people have developed over many decades to try to track these things. I didn't make them up, but they have been validated for many years. You can see each line is a different local authority in the project that I work on. Kent Council, Medway Council, Suffolk Council, and Le, which is a department, a council in France. 
all the lines are lower on the left than they are on the right. And that's a good sign. That means that their life satisfaction has improved. On the right hand side is a graph of whether life is worthwhile, happiness, and the trusting nature of people. Here all the people are lumped together um, across all of the different local authorities. We can see that people's willingness to trust actually spikes pretty high. That's the black line and it's pretty steep. So between the first time they take the questions and the last time, they say things that indicate that they're much more trusting. We also have increases in whether life is worthwhile and in people's happiness. Now, this is all very preliminary data. So this is not uh, findings that I would say you should go out and tell people about immediately that we found the answer to this. But they're leaning in the direction that we want them to go, right? We definitely don't want to see people less happy, more lonely, and uh, thinking that life is less worthwhile. So, if we look at all these things together, then how does social science help create public policy and public services? Well, it can help us allocate scarce resources. It can help us change the ways that we work and make them more effective. It can help us maximize our own efficiency. And there's a lot of stuff that we're still finding out. So. If you want to talk to me about it later, I'd be happy to do that. And if you want to work with some of us, I know I have a lot of colleagues that would be happy to work with you too. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really, um, really, really interesting. Thank you very much, um, Gina. Finally, I would like to introduce our third um, professor today, Professor Paul uh, Boo Habib. Professor Paul Habib is a professor in political theory. He received his PhD degree in politics from Princeton University in 2001 and taught at the University of Bristol and the University of Kibo, um, uh, of Kiel, sorry, uh, before joining Essex in 2006. He has held several research awards, including a Marie Curie Award from the European Commission and Research Fellowship from the Leverhulme Trust. His research focuses on both the history of political thought and contemporary political theory. He's currently writing a book about the ethics of skilled migration entitled The Brain Drain, A Moral Assessment. Over to you, Professor Abu Habib. see if this works. There we go. Great. Okay. Many people believe it's disrespectful when public iconography celebrates persons who committed grave wrongs against others. Examples of such iconography include statues in public squares, names of public streets and schools, and images on national currency. There have been quite a few controversies over disrespectful public iconography in recent times. To mention just a few examples, here's a statue of Christopher Columbus being removed from outside the president of Argentina's office in 2013. And here's an, another example. This is a statue of Cecil Rhodes at the University of Cape Town, which was removed in 2015. And then there was also the statue of Edward Colston being pushed into Bristol Harbor in 2020. To celebrate these historical figures, so it's been argued, is to downplay the wrongs they committed against their victims, and for that reason, disrespectful. In this short talk, I want to raise a question about some of these controversies, namely those in which the authorities who maintain the piece of iconography in question evidently do not endorse the offensive message it conveys. So consider, for example, the statue of the 19th century gynecologist J. Marion Sims, which was inaugurated in New York in 1894 and removed in 2018. The statue celebrated Sims for, among other things, contributions to gynecology he made on the basis of painful medical experiments on enslaved black women in the 1840s. These women, because they were enslaved, lacked the freedom to withhold consent 
to painful treatment at a time when anesthesia was not used. Now, the public officials who maintained the Sim statue just prior to its removal, Mayor Bill de Blasio and others working in his office, had not inaugurated the statue themselves. Neither were they using it as a site for, or, or a backdrop for official ceremonies or treating it in any other way that suggested they endorsed its message. The statue was a cultural artifact they had inherited from the past, and they were maintaining it, it seems fair to say, purely for its historical value, purely because like many other cultural artifacts, it might illuminate the past from which it came. The question I want to raise is therefore this, Given these circumstances, why exactly was it disrespectful to maintain the statue? Now, before I get into that, I thought I'd just mention some other questions that have been raised in this area of political theory and why my question's a bit different. So one of the other questions that people have raised is, is about, excuse me, this is about falling, falling over here, is about um, whether public iconography exposes people to manipulation uh, does public iconography get us to believe things by appealing directly to our emotions and circumventing our rational capacities? Another question that's been asked is about the legitimate purposes of establishing new iconography. When the Bank of England selected Jane Austen to appear on the £10 note, what was its purpose? Was, what was its le legitimate purpose in doing that? Was it because Jane Austen deserved to be appreciated? or because selecting Austin promoted some kind of valuable social ideal? And then another question people have asked is uh, whether once it's established that a piece of iconography is disrespectful, uh, whether it should be reformed or removed, or whether it should be preserved as it is, given the historical value of its remaining where it is. Now, the question I'm asking is a bit different. Uh, I, I, I want to know why exactly an old piece of iconography is disrespectful. My sense is that those who believe this haven't spelt it out in detail. And this is regrettable because I don't think there is a widespread consensus in our society about this issue. So I'd like to see the argument made, and especially in those cases in which the argument seems most difficult to make, namely cases in which the authorities who maintain the iconography evidently do not endorse the offensive mes message it happens to convey. So that's my question. Why does maintaining a piece of public iconography show disrespect if the authorities who maintain it evidently do not endorse its offensive message? Okay, I'm going to cast doubt on two ways we might try to explain that, and then I'm gonna defend the third way of explaining why disrespect is shown. So one natural way to explain why the maintenance of a piece of iconography shows disrespect is this. To maintain iconography, is like many other uses of symbols, to manifest what one believes. To manifest a belief is to externalize a belief that's currently held by the person who's speaking or who's using a symbol. So it's to bring a belief out into the open. The first explanation for why maintaining the Sim statue showed disrespect then is that this manifested a derogatory belief by those who were maintaining it. Now, this explanation doesn't work as, uh, because it's, it's very implausible to think that the public officials who were maintaining the statue in 2018, Mayor Bill de Blasio, he's on the, he's, he's on the right in this picture, it's very implausible to, to, to assume that they were manifesting a derogatory belief about the moral worth of, of Sims as victims. It's not plausible that Mayor de Blasio and other officials working with him believed that Sims as victims lacked moral worth. And because they didn't possess that belief, their maintenance of the Sim statue could not have manifested it or brought it out into the open. Like many other pieces of public iconography inherited from the past, the statue was simply not a vehicle which those who maintain, with which those who maintained it manifested their beliefs. So let's consider another explanation for why maintaining the Sim statue showed disrespect. This second explanation relies on the idea that to maintain iconography that we inherit is to enable a wrong that was done in the past to persist. To, not, to, to inaugurate the Sim statue in 1894, now that was to do something wrong, 
And when public officials later on in 2018 maintained it, they enabled that wrong to persist. That's the idea, okay? Now, to see whether this explanation works, let's think more carefully about the kind of wrong that the past officials did when they inaugurated the Sidden Statue. Well, first, the 1894 public officials manifested their derogatory belief about Sims as victims. So they did externalize a belief they held that Sims as victims lacked full moral worth. They did that when they were celebrating his achievements. And that was wrong. But by 2018, the 1894 officials were, of course, no longer alive, right? So the, the beliefs they held, the beliefs they held in their heads, had expired. Beliefs are like small dots of light inside, inside someone's mind, and the lights had gone out. Because their beliefs had expired by 2018, the statue was no longer externalizing their beliefs. So, by maintaining the statue in 2018, public officials were not enabling that wrong to persist. That is, a wrong of externalizing beliefs that were, being, that were currently being held. Now, I may seem to be missing a point here, Yes, strictly speaking, the statue no longer manifested the derogatory beliefs held in 1894. Because yes, those 1894 officials were dead, and thus were no longer entertaining those beliefs. <laughs> But this overlooks a second kind of wrong uh, that persists when the statue is maintained. The officials in 1894, well, they were attempting to transmit an offensive message, you might say, to future generations when they inaugurated the Sims statue. And the statue did continue to transmit their, their message in 2018, just as a bottle in the sea can continue to convey a message from castaways long after they're dead. So by maintaining the Sims statue, the 2018 officials surely enabled that wrong to persist. That would be the wrong of transmitting an offensive message to the future. The problem with, this, with that explanation for why it's disrespect, disrespectful to maintain the statue, that is that we're, we're enabling the past to transmit an offensive message. The problem with that explanation is that it's not necessarily disrespectful for us to do that. That may sound paradoxical, so let me explain. Consider an analogy. A public library retains on its shelves some books that contain racist passages. This is part of its mission to help the public inform itself about the complex history of their society. Now, in retaining those books, the library enables past authors to convey their offensive messages to the future. But it doesn't seem disrespectful for a public library to do that. Why? Well, there are two points. So first, the library doesn't share the aim of the past racist authors when it retains their books. It isn't complicit with their endeavor. And secondly, it doesn't further their goals to any significant degree, right? So when a public library retains racist, some, uh, some books with racist passages written by past authors, um, it's not as if that's going to cause a mass conversion of people to the, to, to the views of the racist authors. And in fact, it might well have the opposite effect. It might help people understand uh, the nature of racism and resist it. So yes, maintaining an old piece of iconography, like the Sim statue, may well have enabled the past to convey its offensive message, messages. But this kind of an enablement isn't necessarily disrespectful once we think about it carefully. So I'm not sure these two explanations work. And so I'm going to try and, and develop a third explanation uh, that, that, is perhaps, that I hope is more promising. So to see where I'm going, let me take stock. One explanation for why maintaining the Sim statue showed disrespect relied on the idea that iconography manifests belief. Maintaining the statue, so one might think, manifested derogatory beliefs. Yet, it didn't manifest derogatory beliefs on the part of the public officials in 2018. 
And while the statute did manifest derogatory beliefs on the part of public officials in 1894, it stopped doing that when they died. Another explanation for why maintaining the statute showed disrespect relied on the idea of enablement. Those who maintained the statute enabled those in the past to wrong Sims as victims. But that explanation, as we just saw, ran into trouble. So what I want to do is not to rely on those ideas. So I don't want to rely on the idea that iconography manifests belief. I want to put that aside. And I don't want to rely on the idea that we are enabling the past to, commit, to continue committing wrongs. I want to put that idea aside. Okay. So there are going to be two parts to my explanation. The first part uh, is about what hap the kind of wrong we do when we inaugurate iconography that has certain kinds of messages. And what I want to suggest is that that can be wrong, that can be disrespectful even if it doesn't manifest our beliefs. Okay? Now, to show how this is possible, I'm going to get into some rather abstract philosophy. So I apologize. I mean, not as if, it's not as if I haven't been abstract already. I certainly have. I realize that. So suppose you intend to say something true. Oh, this is, sorry, I have to get rid of these pieces of paper. They're falling all over the place. One sec. I'll be right back. I'll get this over here. Right, so suppose you intend to say something true. And you say that Bob Dylan's music is worthless. Now, because you intended to say something true, and given that Dylan's music is valuable, you should not have declared that his music is worthless. To make that declaration, in making that declaration, you've made, uh, to make that declaration is to, have, is to have acted in a way that the value of Dylan's music implies you should not have acted. Now, that's OK. It's okay for people to say that Dylan's music is worthless. Consider now the inauguration of iconography, and in particular the, in the inauguration of the Sim statue. Those who inaugurated the statue intended to declare something true. Because they intended to de declare something true, and given that Sims's victims have full moral worth, they should not have declared that Sims's experiments were worthy of admiration. To have made that declaration, was to act in a way that the moral worth of the victims implied they should not have acted. Now, whereas, as I just said a minute ago, it's OK to act in a way that the value of Dylan's music implies you should not act. It's OK to say that Bob Dylan's music is worthless. It isn't OK uh, to act in a way that the moral worth of another person implies you should not act. In fact, that's the essence of disrespect. Now, notice what I've just argued. I'm suggesting that there's another way in which making a declaration can show disrespect, not by manifesting your belief, but simply by making a declaration that contradicts the moral worth of someone. Because when you do that, in a context where, where you're trying to say the truth, you're acting in a way that their moral worth implies you should not act, and that's disrespectful. Of course, when a speaker says something that contradicts the moral worth of another person, for example, Paul Bouabib is moral, has no moral worth. Suppose somebody says that. That's usually because they want to manifest their belief that Paul Bouabib has no moral worth. What I'm suggesting, however, is that making that declaration, Paul Bouabib has no moral worth, is disrespectful even if it doesn't manifest the speaker's belief about Paul Bouabib. Rather, it just has... It has... It's disrespectful to, to, do, to say Paul Bouabib has no moral worth simply because my moral worth implies you shouldn't do that and you're acting in a way that my moral, my moral worth therefore implies you shouldn't act. Nothing, it doesn't have to be the case that you're manifesting your belief. You just have to be making a declaration that contradicts my worth. And that's important now. Why? Because if disrespect was shown by inaugurating the Sim statue, merely insofar as his declaration contradicted the worth of Sims's victims, that disrespect continued to be shown so long as the statute continued to make that declaration. The wrong done when the statue was inaugurated did not end then, once the inaugurators died and their beliefs expired, but continued as long as the statue stood. Now you might think, that's enough, that's it, we've got the argument there. We can show why it's disrespectful to maintain a statue. It's because the declaration it's making is one that it's, well, it's continuing to make that disrespectful declaration. 
But I don't think we're there yet, because think again about public libraries. They retain books by past racist authors on their shelves, and those books continue to make offensive declarations. But I don't think the public libraries are showing disrespect when they retain those books. So there's still something missing in the argument. And so now we come to the second step of my argument. There's a different relationship between us and the past from that of enablement, of us enabling people in the past to do something. A different relationship that's very important to bear in mind here, and that is that we're answerable for what our predecessors have done. This relationship, being answerable for others, is encapsulated in a certain kind of language we often use, a very natural kind of language. It's natural to say, for example, that the public officials who inaugurated the Sim statue in 1894 made a declaration in the name of the association they represented, in the name of the city of New York. And it's natural to say that when the public officials in 2018 maintained the statue, they did that also in the name of New York, the city of New York. It could even be natural to say that the city of New York made a declaration when it inaugurated the statue and continued to make that declaration in 2018. Now, why am I saying all that? Well, because when we speak in those ways that attribute agency to multiple generations, when we speak as if multiple generations are one agent, um, there's a truth to that way of speaking. First, let me just, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what that truth is in a minute, but let me just give you another example of how we often do this. We say things like, the UK must compensate for the war crimes it committed during the Boer War, or the, we say the UK owes a financial debt that it incurred in the 1950s. And what we mean when we speak in those ways is that the later generations in the UK are answerable for what the earlier generations have done. That's a natural way of speaking, and there's a truth in that way of speaking, and, and that is that different generations um, uh, must combine and share with each other responsibility for what they do when they, when they share a political association. So when the declaration was made in 1894 in the name of the city of New York and in the name of all New Yorkers, including those in 2018, the 2018 generation were answerable for that declaration. And when they maintained the statue, they failed to revoke a declaration, therefore, for which they were answerable. And it's in that that the disrespect to Vin Sims's victims lies. It's the fact that something was said in the past that ought never have been said, and it was said in our name, and we didn't revoke it. We didn't undo it. We didn't take it back. So that's my brief explanation for why maintaining pieces of public iconography can be disrespectful, even when public officials who maintain them evidently don't endorse the offensive message they convey. We'll need to navigate our way past many other questions in the ethics of public iconography, but I hope this talk has given you a sense that it's worth exploring this area in political theory. So thank you very much. very much. That was really, really a, a fantastic way um, to end. So thank you very much to our three professors. That was really fantastic, very enlightening, very thought-provoking. And um, in the interest of our drinks, which are waiting for us, I'll just allow maybe three questions, maybe one for each of our professors would be really nice. And I have one right in front of me.
Yes, just, yeah. I'll just project my yeah. voice. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, thank you for that uh, very interesting question. Um, so the, the question is really about what, what do we mean by complicity? And I was assuming that you're complicit when you share the aim of the wrongdoer. You're sort of, an, a, you're, um, you and the wrongdoer have a shared aim to do, to do the wrong in question. But you're pointing out that that isn't quite a plausible way of understanding the notion of complicity, because when the U UK government sells arms to evil regimes, it doesn't necessarily share any of their aims, but we would say they're complicit. So I think you could use a word in a broader sense. So you could say you're also complicit if you foreseeably um, enable someone to do something, not necessarily with, by, uh, in sharing their aim. Fine, that's call, call that a broader conception of complicity. I don't think we're, public libraries are complicit, uh, neither in that broader sense, um, because when they retain books on their shelves, they don't really assist the people in the past to achieve their goals. It's true that they assist the people in the past, the racist authors, to transmit their messages, but the goal of the racist authors isn't thereby being achieved. Because what happens is people borrow the books, learn about racism, and, and resist maybe racism. So it's, it's not complicit neither in the narrower sense, where you own, we have to share the aims, nor in the broader sense, I think. And that's why the enablement argument doesn't work. So if we could get another question for another professor. Yes. Thank you. That's an excellent question. And I don't know all of the services available. I should say, first of all, that I want to call out to Dr. and Professor Renee Luthra, who is the head of our Migration Studies Center. Um, and if you want to, could you raise your hand, Renee? If you want to speak to her afterward, she may be able to help connect you with some colleagues who know more about it than I do. I do know that there is a program called Homes for Ukraine right now. Um, and my guess is that when those residents come in uh, and they are placed with people in the UK, residents of the UK, that the services they receive are not as comprehensive as any of us would like. So it's that part is quite unfortunate. But um, every area in the UK now does offer social prescribing. And if you ask, or if anyone asks their local GP network or their GP surgery, they should be able to find who offers it in their area. And that would at least hopefully give them some outlets for social interaction and also for contacting the relevant benefits offices if it's working well. Um, but let me think about that too, and I'll get back to you about that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Final question in the back. How 
do you think this logic and the gender narrative apply across different ideologies of different groups? So if you can just elaborate on that. Yeah, so, uh, so the both questions are really interesting, and with respect to the first one, I mean, I think there there are a lot of discussions within groups about what's uh, you know what's appropriate, and there certainly would be some some pushback. I mean, um, if, I suppose that if leaders in the group didn't want women to be part of the group, then they wouldn't be part of the group. I mean, that's that's an argument that I make in my book that it's. Yeah, I mean, there's supply and demand arguments for women's participation, and the supply is, you know, the, the proportion of women who are willing to join if given an opportunity, and the demand is whether the group, you know, wants them or how much the group wants to recruit them. And ultimately, you know, even if there's a big supply, the group at the end of the day decides whether they're going to let women in and what roles they're going to fill. So there's still, you know, very much a gender dimension to the decision making when, you know, empirically, in almost all groups, the leadership is overwhelmingly male. There, there are very few exceptions. Um, so, you know, there is a gatekeeping mechanism there, and if, if groups don't want women to participate, then they don't. Um, kind of relatedly, there's, and this I don't think has been explored as much, that even if some groups are supportive of women's participation, the communities they draw from are supportive of women's participation early on, at some point, they, the communities and the groups may suffer some uh, some backlash from it, um, and there are cases, uh, particularly cases in Sub-Saharan Africa, like with Zano PF and with the EPLF, where local communities decided, you know, like this is getting too much. You're taking too many of our women. You're changing the gender dynamics in the villages, and so then the groups kind of, while they had initially framed themselves as very, um, you know progressive and, and you know, pro-women's recruitment, they then scaled back because they got pushed back from the, from the community. So there is, you know, it's not a, a static relationship. There's a dynamic relationship that could certainly be further explored. Um, and then, you know, just really quickly, your, um, your second question, it does vary across groups. And, and unfortunately, I didn't get to talk about it very much because I ran out of time. But you know, um, conservative groups and those with more traditionalist ideologies uh, are much less likely to recruit women. Um, and then, as I showed very briefly, like their audiences, that makes sense because their audiences are also much more skeptical about women's participation and the benefits that might be derived from it. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just take this opportunity to do a little plug-in for the next uh, professorial inaugural lectures, which are going to be already next Wednesday, the 15th of February. And this is going to be from the Department of Sociology. So just to give you quickly the titles, we are going to have Professor Rene uh, Luthra, who is going to be speaking about From Origins to Destinations, Understanding the Lives of Immigrants and Their Children. And then we're also going to have Professor Sandhya Hewamani, who will be speaking about Transnationalism, Neoliberalism, and Fluid Identities. So another exciting time coming up next week. So for now, thank you very much for coming. It was really great to see you here in person, and also to our sort of friends uh, who are joining us online. Please join us in the Winter Garden, but sort of finally to say really, really great thank you to our amazing three professors, to Reed and to Gina and to Paul, thank you very much, really, really fantastic folks.